All right. Okay, so let's get started. Cool. Um, so yeah, this is kind of neat. Uh, first time speaking outdoors anyways. Um, so I'm just here to talk about my story, uh, but this isn't my Meet Calvin. I have the other presentation that I've done, Meet Calvin. It's kind of my story in a nutshell, um, illustrated with stick people and things like that. This is still my story, but a whole new way of telling it. I decided, let's just look at other ways to, to tell the same story. Um, and I know that this event here was described as, you know, Calvin Newfeld talking about his experience living as a trans person in uh, Lanark County. But I've only lived in Lanark County for five years now. So I figured, well, why not use that to track my story back through all the places that I have lived and observations and experiences that I've had in the different places that I've lived. Um, so I was um, born and raised in Montreal. Um, in the, uh, I, was, I was raised a Christian, a uh, very conservative evangelical Christian. Um, our family was from the Mennonite tradition. We attended a Brethren church and I attended private Christian school. And, um, and of course, I was born a girl. I, I assume probably you all know that by now if you aren't already familiar with my story. Um, but I should probably make that really clear because it's kind of funny, after one of my talks, I often go and speak to high schools and students. At the end of one of my presentations, my story, Meet Calvin, one of the students came up to me and said, you know what, I, only, I didn't get it until the end. I said, well, what, what, what didn't you get? And he said, well, all this time you're talking about I was born a girl and this and that, you're telling this story, but all I see is a guy, so I didn't understand at all what you were talking about until the end when there was this picture of me as a younger girl with uh, today's picture of me now kind of thing. And then he's like, then he got it. So in case there's any confusion at all about I was born a girl, um, that's just to make that really, really clear. And uh, growing up, um, I wanted to be a minister. That was sort of what I wanted to be growing up. Um, in fact, I kind of wanted to be either a missionary or a minister. And it's funny because uh, I remember one time telling my great uncles, one of my great uncles about that. And one of one of these old great, great uncle Herman, right? I don't know what, who he was. Um, you know, he said, well, let me give you one piece of advice. If you listen to one piece of advice in all of your life, let it be this. Don't become a minister, become a missionary. And I think that that was because he saw it as wrong for a female to become a minister. And I thought that was a bit odd, but I just, you know, smile and nod. Um, and uh, certainly the church that I was raised in, women weren't allowed to speak. Uh, and I challenged that. Uh, my school, uh, I gave a speech one year in high school about women having the right to speak um, <laughs> in a religious context. And I actually was given the opportunity to give that speech at my church. So that was kind of uh, groundbreaking anyways, a female at least giving a speech, if not a sermon, in my church. Um, and I, I also want to make it really clear here, though, that as I go through my story, I'm going to be talking a lot about gender roles, expectations, and things like that. And I don't want there to be any confusion that the gender roles that I've experienced, uh, that I've experienced and that I'll be commenting on tonight had nothing to do with transitioning for me. Um, it's, it, people don't transition because they don't like the gender role that they have. People transition to align their body with the gender that they are. Um, we know that uh, <clears throat> transsexuality is a medical condition. Uh, it's recognized by all of the major medical uh, associations, North American Medical Associations, as a serious medical condition, which if left untreated can result in clinically significant psychological distress, dysfunction, debilitating depression, and for some people without access to appropriate medical care and treatment, suicidality and death. And the recommended treatment for transsexuality is transition. We know that we've tried to, people have tried for decades to try to fix the brain and it doesn't work, it only results in broken people. But fixing the body works, and that is the recommended treatment. Um, so my observations and experiences with gender roles and expectations had nothing to do with my reasons for transitioning. But I find them interesting anyways, especially looking back. So I'll be commenting here on there, here and there about that, and I think that, um, you know, I, as a male of female experience, I am in a unique position to, to see a lot of what's going on gender-wise in the world. I've looked at life from both sides now, as, as the song says. So back to so my story. Um, it was in kindergarten. I was in kindergarten when I first started talking about feeling like I was a boy. And I got teased. And I vowed then and there that I would never speak about it again. 
Uh, if you're interested in, uh, I wrote a story uh, based on that experience. It's on my website under articles uh, called I Learned in Kindergarten. So if you're interested in a bit of a look into that particular part of my life. And I think this goes back to the importance of raising awareness about these things. People often think, oh, well, you don't want to bring this to young ages and stuff. That wouldn't be appropriate, but it is. Your gender identity forms between the age of two and three years old. And if you wait until people are that much older before talking about these things, then a lot of damage has already been done by then. Uh, in grade two, I lived in Israel for a year with my family. We were on sabbatical. And in Israel, the gender roles were, in Jewish society, really clearly divided, the gender roles. I remember um, going to the Wailing Wall, um, which is one of the holiest places in Israel. It's considered one of the holiest places where people go to pray. They go to pray at the Wailing Wall. And there's the main part of the wall for the men, and then uh, cordoned off, and then this is where the women can go to pray. And I remember wondering, like, what, why the divide? And it clearly wasn't to keep men out of women's space. It was to keep women out of men's space. There's such a subtlety to that difference. All it is is a divide, but in that subtlety is everything. And in Muslim society, we spent time also in Egypt, and in Muslim society, uh, that divide is even more pronounced uh, between men and women. And I remember um, we went to, uh, in entering the mosque, for example, the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim the holiest Muslim place and in order to go in there men could go in no problem but for a woman to go in she had to wear something that covered her whole body top to bottom I was too young it's at a certain age I didn't have to wear that but I remember my sister having to wear it and you know just covering covering up like that and I, I remember feeling as a female excluded from full personhood but in my case, I experienced it as a male being perceived as a female and excluded. So twice excluded. First from maleness and second from full personhood. And I have to admit that I ended up with a resentment towards men. <laughs> uh, they were sloppy, unattractive, gross, and I couldn't be one. And I was expected to find these sloppy, unattractive guys attractive and I was treated like a girl. Each of these were separate but related injuries. Added together, they resulted in resentment towards men. So growing up, I went around with the attitude that men are pigs, which ironically ended up causing confusion for my mother later in life when I finally came out to her as a transsexual. And, you know, I asked her, I said, like, did you never suspect? You never, you never thought, you know, you never suspected it. Eh? And she said, well, no, I mean, at the very least, she figured that all those years of me going around saying men are pigs, she never figured I'd actually want to be one. But of course, it's not about wanting to be something. And I explained to her the many levels of my resentment towards men, which included feeling like one, but being excluded. Um, having also been expected to be attracted to those guys was just adding insult to injury. But the bottom line is it's not because I think guys are great that I identify as a guy. I think women are great, but that doesn't mean that I feel like one or that I want to be one. So it's not about gender preference, it's about the gender that I am. <laughs> so, um, so back to the chronology, uh, after Israel, back to my life in Montreal, and I should point out that despite everything, I had a happy childhood. Happy, happy, I was happy. I had the best parents, I had great siblings, um, all older than me, two sisters and a brother, and I figured, well, I'll talk a little bit about my siblings today, because I, I haven't ever actually done that before in a talk. Um, my sister, just, just above me in age, we grew up together, literally, we shared the same bed for the first 10 years or so, I don't know, I, I shared the same room until we were really fully into adolescence and then I got my own, but we grew up together, and we're actually quite inseparable. And then gradually that evolved into a lot of play fighting, a lot of rough and tumble. And um, there were <laughs> the play fights were more play for her than they were for me. I'm not a fighter. I don't get the point of fighting, not even, not even in play. There's not a bone in my body that wants to hurt anyone. 
Um, but that's what was fun for my sister, and I, uh, and she had lots of fun with me, and uh, she would always win the fights because she knew that I wouldn't and couldn't hurt her. Um, so yeah, the fights are mostly unidirectional, but um, it gave my sister great delight, and I knew it was her way of expressing her affection for me, and her resentment too sometimes. Uh, fair enough. But uh, thinking back on it now, I think I grew up tough. It made me grow up tough and strong in the holist sense. I grew up tough, taking blows with patience, taking pain in a spirit of fun. That's tough. Tough is being able to take a blow without it stirring any violence in you. That's tough and strong. In all our play fighting, I refused to use my strength to hurt her. I would use it to protect myself or to throw her off of me if necessary, or to eventually put a resolute end to the play fighting when it wasn't fun for me anymore, which usually took the form of me gripping her shoulders and immobilizing her against the wall to show that I was done. But I never used my strength with the intention of hurting her. That's strength. Strength is refusing to use strength as violence. That's strength. And I want to make a connection here to bullying. I talk about bullying quite a bit. Um, and I not to suggest that my sister's behavior was bullying. Even though I wrote to her the other day asking for permission to talk about this today. And she admitted that she does feel like she bullied me. That often it made her, she felt guilty about that occasionally. Um, but that's not the way that I experienced it for the most part. I loved her and I knew she loved me and we had fun. And I wouldn't trade our memories for anything. Um, oh, and she added that she appreciates the fact that I didn't use my strength against her. She said, you were treating me the way a brother should. But that was, that was nice. Um, and the play fighting was just one small part of a lifelong sibling relationship. I don't want it to appear out of proportion, but it's a piece that comes to mind to think, to talk about today. And I think even play fighting can be a disguise for violence. It is violence, after all, playfully administered. And all forms of violence have a connection to bullying. So the point that I want to make about bullying and connection to this is that you will experience violence in life. Not just physical violence. Physical violence is possibly the least common form of violence. There is also violence of words and emotions. In loving relationships and unloving relationships, there will be blows, there will be pains, there will be violence. You can't escape it. But there's a freedom, I think, that comes with the realization of what you can learn from it, what you can observe in it. The many motivations behind violence, large, small, overt, subtle, playful, serious. And if you're able to experience violence without it stirring any violence in you, and if you refuse to use your own strength as violence, then you will experience true toughness, true strength, and that feels good. That's the flip side of the bad. In everything that life throws at you, every bad thing, you can grow out of it something beautiful, like a gardener. Uh, my oldest sister was less rambunctious, more sensitive. She expressed her affection through her generosity, giving gifts to us. Of all of the kids, her gifts were the most thoughtful and the most expensive, nothing but the best for the family that she loved. She gave of her time, taking me and my other sister out to the movies, to Shakespeare in the Park, to the amusement park La Ronde. She was the most responsible out of all of us kids to the benefit of my other sister and I, who tagged along delightedly but often unappreciatively to all the wonderful experiences that our oldest sister gave us. And she was equally generous with her thoughtfulness. One time I was trying to sell acorns by the side of the road. I'd spent all day gathering them up in a wagon full, selling them for a penny each. By the end of the day, nobody bought any, not one. I guess acorns don't sell very well, not even at a penny. 
And as I turned back to the house in despair, there was my sister walking up the driveway towards me. And she held out a $5 bill and asked to buy all of my acorns. That moment, that generosity, is one of my strongest and most treasured memories. I don't know if I've ever felt richer. And looking back, it's also sad to see that between my two sisters, there was a lot of rivalry, competition, and I think a lot of it was competition for my, my time, my attention, and my affection. And that created rivalry between them. Um, and that, that was unfortunate. It was, it was long-standing. They've since totally bonded now. They're, they're each other's number one fans. But it makes me think back to how things could have been different, had they been different. Uh, my, my brother was the oldest of us, and he'd always wanted a brother. Instead, he got three younger sisters. And by the time I was old enough to have good, solid memories, he was entering adolescence, which, as we all know, transforms human beings into another creature entirely. One that doesn't quite exist on the same plane of existence as the rest of us. Um, and certainly doesn't live in a house, but rather roosts or is fairly in residence, perhaps. And the room is not so much of a room as a habitat. It's a strange thing. But anyway, my brother mostly kept to his habitat, and I was preoccupied with the sister soap opera. So he and I missed out on a proper brotherhood. But we're making up for lost time. It's particularly fun considering that we're almost identical now. Even my wife and his wife and my parents and his kids get really confused when we're in the same place at the same time. His kids call me Uncle Daddy. But all of this leaves me wondering just how different my life would have been if I hadn't been what I am. If I'd been born a boy, for instance, my sisters would have naturally bonded. And my brother and I would have um, uh, had a natural brotherhood. But we were all robbed of that. Um, and meanwhile, I floated along with no natural role to live out. Outside of my family, I played mostly with the boys in my younger years, doing the things that boys do. We were G.I. Joes by day and Ninja Turtles by night. Uh, but as we grew up, it became more and more apparent to me and to my friends that I was actually a girl. I literally grew apart from my friends. And I couldn't relate to other girls. So again, in the realm of friendships, I floated along with no natural role to live out. Adolescence hit like a ton of bricks. I was in grade five, very young, but I had always been an early bloomer. Before and after puberty, I'd always been tall, athletic, muscular, taller and stronger than all the girls and even the boys. It wasn't until grade 10 that I was no longer the tallest student in the class, in my grade. Um, but thinking back on the athletic part of my life is, is actually kind of interesting. Take Jim, for instance. Um, I went to the same school from kindergarten until my high school graduation. So I had the same teachers, mostly the same teachers, same gym, gym teacher all through, all through school. So he saw me literally grow up. And I, it, I don't know if this is the case in all schools, but in our schools, grading people in gym was divided by gender. Girls were graded by one set of standards and boys by the others. So, for example, if a girl had to do 50 sit-ups in an hour to get 100% on a test, a boy had to do 100. Same with push-ups, etc. And by high school, my gym teacher had stopped grading me on the girl's scale altogether. In all categories, he graded me on the boy's scale. And I still topped them all. Push-ups, sit-ups, rope climbing, flexibility, high jump, long jump, sprinting, everything but long distance running, which I've never been able to do. Dodgeball was my favorite. I was downright deadly. In dodgeball, the gym teacher would often handicap the boys to even out the stakes. Um, they, or if you were right-handed, you had to play left-handed. So he would shout out, okay, boys, play with your left hand and Caitlin. My name was Caitlin at the time. And it's funny now thinking back to that. Always, the boys have to do this and Caitlin. Boys and Caitlin. And it's funny thinking back on that. And again, it's, it's like I had a boyhood and I didn't. Again, something floating between the two. Uh, I never felt mistreated by my gym teacher though. Never once disrespected. He never once made, made me feel odd for being an athletic female. 
It was never an awkward thing that he set me apart from the other girls, um, except when it came to wrestling. That was tricky because the usual gender divide and Caitlin wouldn't work in that scenario. He couldn't pair me up with a girl because I was stronger than the girls and most of the boys. And he couldn't pair me up with the boys because this was, after all, a conservative evangelical private Christian school and that would have been abominable. So the girls were paired up with the girls, the boys were paired up with the boys, and I had to wrestle my gym teacher. And I know that there's really actually no way of saying that without it sounding gross. Um, no student wants to wrestle their teacher. But I can assure you that there was nothing actually gross or inappropriate about it. My gym teacher was never anything but professionally excellent. And when I think about what my experience might have been in another setting, where there might have been teasing, ostracism, bruised male egos, bullying, or sexual harassment, I realize how lucky I was, insanely lucky, to have had the teacher that I did. He was only ever interested in challenging each of his students, male or female, to reach their highest potential. And baseball. Outside of school, I played baseball for years, and I kicked butt. I got the nickname Killer, even though I was never mean, and I would never intentionally hurt anybody. But when I threw a ball, I threw it fast and straight and strong as a bullet. And more than once, this took someone out. In one case, an assistant coach got it, straight in the throat, and was taken to hospital. He's okay. <laughs> And when I hit the ball, it also went straight and fast and strong as a bullet. And more than once, this took someone out. I remember the first time I ever hit a ball in baseball, I was in grade three, and the older students had agreed to let me play. The pitch, I swung, and the ball made a beeline for the pitcher's stomach and took him out. I still remember his name even, and I'm still sorry for that. Um, so basically, yeah, over the years, I, I got the nickname Killer. And again, it's interesting looking back on this stuff. How many pieces fall into place? How many times it was commented that I threw like a boy, exactly like a boy. It was commented that I slid into home base like a boy. There was even one time where I got hit by the ball pretty hard and shook it off. And I, you, a com uh, another parent commented to my mom that uh, he'd never even seen a boy shake off an injury like that. You know, so it's, it's interesting looking back how easy it is to see that I was a boy and how hard it was to see. Um, then there was the difference of my body changing with adolescence. I didn't just experience the things that you typically associate with female puberty, which are horrible, but it was also the things that you don't think about. I remember when I began to notice that I wasn't walking or running right anymore. Um, something was changing about how my legs moved. So before they used to go straight and fast and efficient, and then all of a sudden they started to <laughs> to turn out like that and it affected my performance as a walker and a runner it, my hips changing into the childbearing variety and it was then that the boys finally started out running me I couldn't run properly anymore and it may, has made walking even feel weird to me to this day so you know often when people think about transsexuality trans stuff and gender dysphoria they associate it with stuff up here you know and stuff down there but it's everything it's in everything even for me I feel it in my hips my brain expects to walk like this it expects my hips to move like that not like that and it's the dysphoria is always there in some form or another for trans people it's just a question of trying to minimize the dysphoria to a point that's livable puberty came with a lot of changes so my body turned girl for real that was one a big one also, my friends turned into boys who like girls, and that was an awkward one, since I was definitely not a girl who likes boys. And I broke a few naive hearts. And at the same time, I was increasingly aware of a few remarkably attractive female teachers. And none of it was making sense. Puberty brought a cascade of confusion and guilt and awkwardness. And on top of it all, independent from everything else the worst of the changes that came with puberty for me depression i remember vividly the experience of it the change as my body was changing something was happening also in my brain a sinking a suffocation uh, physically in my brain itself 
separate from everything happening externally in my life. And I think that was, it was best described by Sylvia Plath in her book and in its title, The Bell Jar. And the bell jar being a jar that goes over a bell or a clock, a glass jar, and imagining that over you and suffocating and the staleness of the air in it. That describes the experience of depression for me. And so I've been asked to speak um, on occasion about mental illness. And I think it's important to make the point that mental illness is not always related to what's going on in your life. There are two forms of mental illness. There's the physical, biological, medical form, and that needs treatment. And then there's the mental illness that forms where you suppress yourself, where you hate yourself, where you let in hurtful messages, send hurtful messages to yourself, where you hold on to bitter memories. Mental illness forms where you hide, withdraw, escape. Escape from life, from relationships, from the vulnerability of love, from the truth about something. Escape to alcohol, drugs, television, video games, work, sex, pleasure, fantasy. Escape, escape, escape from life and all its solemn responsibility and desperate need and tenderness and truthfulness and grace, to quote my mother. The treatment for both forms of mental illness depends on one thing, which is truth, openness. If you have mental illness, be out with it, and then you can deal with it. It's secrecy and lies and shame that fertilize both forms of mental illness. Mental illness grows best in the dark. So at puberty, I found myself drowning in both forms of mental illness. And I want to make it clear at this point that through all of the dark times, I never escaped to alcohol or drugs. I'm not saying I never had a drink, but I never escaped to drink. And I never touched drugs. I had an abhorrence for drugs of any kind. It felt like cheating. So I stayed with the pain, with my suffering, and I'm glad, glad, glad to this day that I did. As terrible as everything was, I'm glad that I experienced it raw. If I had numbed my pain artificially, how could I have ever found my way through it and out of it? But I did escape from life, from relationships, and I numbed my pain in other ways. So again, at, at puberty, both forms of mental illness emerged. The physical kind, which I did everything in my power to conceal and to bear as best I could, and the other kind, which comes from, from hiding from the truth. I felt like a boy, but I did my best to be a girl, all the while feeling like a female imposter. I was only interested in girls, but did my best to pretend otherwise, which was ridiculous and degrading. I got used to pretending, keeping my inner life secret, walls built around, thoughts running rampant and unchecked by the kind of sense that you gain from sharing your thoughts with others. Thinking is a dangerous pastime. It is the most dangerous pastime, perhaps, so it's wise to tread cautiously and to keep thinking in its place. Thoughts are not truth not truth and it is so important to remember this especially in the context of mental illness mental illness lies adolescence flipped me completely before I became a teenager I remember promising to my mom that I would never become a teenager I'd seen it happen to three older siblings the transformation and I promised her this will not happen to me no matter what it takes I will weather the storm, puberty, without withdrawing or metamorphosing into something remotely, belligerently resembling human. I promised again and again, and I really meant it. I would stay good and pure and true, and I would never betray a promise, but I was genuinely unprepared for what came, particularly the depression. 
Without that, I think I would have navigated the hard years of adolescence considerably better. And I was a good kid. Pure hearted. Never told a lie. Except now, thinking back, that kindergarten lie where I had said I felt like a boy and got teased. And then I lied my way out of that situation like that. So that was a lie. That was possibly my first. After that, there are only two lies that I remembered before everything went all wrong. Um, and one of the lies was hazy. Uh, the hazy lie being that my dad had told us always never to turn up the thermometer, but one kid or another would always be going and turning it up. I think maybe I had done it one time. He asked who had done it, and maybe I lied, but it's hazy. It could have been someone else. The other lie being when I was in grade three, and I knew I wasn't allowed to take chocolate chips from the cupboard, but I wanted a chocolate chip so bad. I did exactly what I knew I wasn't allowed to, and I stole three chocolate chips, three. And then I went off to school, and I spent that day, I practically sweating with guilt. I felt so bad, I couldn't wait to get home and tell my mom what I'd done so that I could be free of the lie. And I told her, and you got up, walked to the kitchen, and came back with a bowl of chocolate chips for me. So that was, that was my great lie. And so to think of going from that to a life of lies, the change, and the impact that that has. And I want to share a bit of my mom's perspective that she shared years ago with the church that we were attending at the time, trying to enter into dialogue with them about what kind of welcome we could expect at the church. So I was still Caitlin with Sharon. And um, this is the beginning of what she shared with our church. She said, I could start by describing Caitlin as a child. Curly blonde hair, pudgy little toddler legs, the baby of the family. Loving, thoughtful, mature and protective. The word bright, an understatement. Her French teacher called her doué, gifted. Also an understatement. Please forgive the flattery in this, my mother wrote it. But I could also start by describing Caitlin's goodness. She won't tell you about this, so I'll have to do it. Devotion to God, integrity of life, compassion. These defined her days and her years. The first book report she wrote was on the book of Genesis in the Bible, which she read in its entirety when she was seven years old. Her Bible quickly became earmarked and underlined and cross-referenced. She began saving every penny so that one day she could pursue her dream of going into ministry. Then why? What could have happened when one day Caitlin stopped communicating with us, pulled away, stiffened and almost shuddered when we tried to hug her, and began to self-destruct? We stood by without comprehension and watched as this precious, holy, happy child became a tortured, haunted, solitary, closed-off adolescent, and there was nothing we could do about it, no way to understand what was happening or why. In the words of Carol Shields, our worlds shattered like a pane of glass. I had no idea how Caitlin could ever recover from whatever it was that was draining the life out of her. These were the dark ages of my life. From the age of about 13 to 23, I sunk deeper and deeper into self-destruction, anorexia, bulimia, and self-mutilation. I don't think I need to go into specifics. I don't want to indulge the darkness or to paint a drama out of it. But I was consumed by it, by my despair, self-hatred, and an abhorrence of life. I don't do anything half-heartedly, and I poured my whole sick and withered heart into my own self-destruction. I got away with it by hiding, by controlling what people saw and knew about me. I wanted to kill myself or to die trying, and the only way I could get away with it was to ensure that no one knew just how sick I really was. And people often wonder and ask how my parents could not have known. Well, first of all, parents do know. A parent knows when their child is suffering. And they did try. They did try to reach through to me. But the walls I had built were impenetrable. And at the same time, never underestimate 
the power that each of us has to put on a good show, whatever storm may be raging underneath. If someone really doesn't want their suffering to be seen, don't feel surprised or guilty or ashamed if you failed to see it. I left home when I was 15. My parents moved out of the province and I stayed behind to finish my high school. And that made secrecy easier. And then I went on into university at 17, very young, naive, and when I think of it, not mentally well at all. Still, I did well, I got excellent grades, until halfway through my second year when I was finally too sick to function at all anymore. By then I was living in the home of a family with five girls. They were the most wonderful family, loving, creative, fun. I felt good among them, but still, I was never fully among them. My secrets set me apart from them. What little they knew about my self-harm and eating disorders made them awkward around me, distrustful even. They saw my self-harm as a betrayal of them. And to my shame, they were absolutely right. But there were other distances too. By then, I really couldn't ignore anymore that I was only attracted to women, which in my eyes at the time made me a lesbian. And this family was conservative, evangelical Christian. I remember one time overhearing the mother, who is a wonderful, awesome lady, or was when I knew her. I love her to bits and I would never suggest otherwise, but I overheard her comment after a family friend had just visited who had recently come out as a gay man. And she said that if he hadn't been who he was, she would never have let that man into my house. So often these are just isolated passing statements, often emerging from the heat of the moment, or from some discomfort freshly felt, or from past experiences and sentiments freshly remembered, or even just from thoughtlessness. And often these kinds of statements don't reflect how a person truly feels towards gay people or how they would treat a gay person in reality. But what we often fail to realize is that it's often the isolated passing statement that gets overheard, remembered, and integrated into the self-esteem of some vulnerable person in our midst. Thoughts are dangerous, and words are dangerous. So again, it's wise to tread carefully, and to keep words in their place. Words are tools. But there's a fine line between a tool and a weapon, the only difference being how it's used. The next few years of my life were nomadic. Between 1997 and 2006, I packed up and moved 22 times, averaging a move every five months for nine years. I lived with what I could carry with me and went where life took me, across Ontario, Quebec, the Maritimes, the UK, even Australia. The home was anywhere and nowhere. When I was 20, 20, 21, I joined my parents on a sabbatical year in France. How can you say no to the opportunity? And we also spent time in Spain and Portugal. France, I thought was beautiful, but smelled bad. Spain and Portugal were beautiful and smelled good. But I was still very unwell at this time. And totally shut in and secretive. So even then I couldn't let my parents in. I couldn't be in relationship with them and I kept them at a distance. But I think it was healing for me, just being in a safe place again, floating around the periphery of family, in a static space between isolation and belonging. Mostly I stayed in my room, I seldom spoke, and I would walk behind my parents, not alongside them. Although for that, there was more than one reason. There are a lot of good-looking women in France and the last thing I wanted was for my parents to see that it wasn't those good-looking, dark Frenchmen who were attracting my attention, right? So there's so many reasons that a child or a kid or an adolescent or even a young adult will shut out their parents. So many ways and often it's so subtle, so subtle that you can pretend that your folks are making a big deal out of nothing if they call you on it. And there are so many motivations also to shutting your parents out. 
Sometimes it's, you just need a bit of distance, which is a natural and healthy process. But what's a tragedy is when kids shut out their parents for unnatural and unnecessary reasons. And I don't mean unnatural as in homosexuality is unnatural. I mean the real unnatural, which is being ashamed of homosexuality, or bisexuality, or transsexuality. Being ashamed of what's natural is what's unnatural. But, of course, at the time, I didn't understand this at all. And I was ashamed of who and what I was. Recently, my mother commented, reflecting back on all the dark times a full decade of my life lost, she said, on all of this, because of a wrong belief, just a wrong belief. And that is a deep wondering, the what if that comes with that, and the why. But as I emphasize in my talks about sexual and gender diversity, the problems that we have about these things are really problems of not understanding. The wrong beliefs just come out of the not understanding. So for me, it's just a matter of, let's see what we can do about understanding. And also a thought that emerges from this, about wrong belief. I think that many parents who have been through an experience like this would have some feelings of guilt or regret or a sense of responsibility for the wrong beliefs that can lead to a child's suffering. A lot of my suffering did come from my belief that homosexuality was unnatural and sinful, but I have never blamed my parents, my church, the Bible, or Christianity for any of it. I was certainly raised in an environment generally that nurtured this belief, but I have always thought for myself, always formed my own opinions. I don't believe anything unless I see the truth of it for myself. And for me, that is the only way to have integrity. So I am the one responsible for my beliefs, even and especially my wrong beliefs. I think if we all felt the same responsibility, there would be a lot less blame going around, a lot less resentment, and a lot less unforgiveness, and more confidence, more independence, and more integrity. So if I suffered as a result of my belief that who and what I was was unnatural and sinful, the responsibility is my own. Not my parents, not my church, not the Bible, not Christians, me. I had formed a wrong belief. I believed that homosexuality was sinful based on not understanding it at all. And I knew nothing whatsoever about transsexuality, so that particular piece of my puzzle was still beyond my grasp. So I found myself a lesbian and a devout Christian. What to do with this great problem of how I would live my life? Would I live it alone? Would I deny myself companionship and intimacy in my obeisance? of what I believed God wanted? And what if I was wrong? What if I lived my life alone in an attempt at purity only to discover too late that I had based my belief, my life on a wrong belief after all? That, I thought, would have been the greater tragedy, the greater betrayal of God's intention for my life if God in fact desires for each of us to know love and faithfulness in relationship. Denying love in obeisance of a wrong belief seemed a worse sin than breaking a moral code for the sake of love. But still, this was all theoretical, and it wasn't enough to convince me that who and what I was was okay. After Europe, I returned to university in a further effort to get my life back on track, and I continued searching for answers. But all the while, still, these were the dark ages, and as I put on a good show, my self-destruction grew ever more refined and intentional. Remember at university, I one time went to see a therapist at a friend's urging. 
and talking about that I was attracted to women and I believe this was sinful and on and on. And this was a university based atheist therapist. She just thought the whole thing was absurd. Absurd that I was suffering the way I was suffering over a religious belief. But that wasn't what I needed to hear. I didn't need to hear the absurdity of it. And I remember another friend that I spoke to who was a Christian, but I would not describe her as a devout one. And she said the same thing. This is silly. There's nothing wrong with it. It's silly. You're being silly. And that wasn't the voice that I needed either. I needed to hear the voice of somebody whose devotion to God and to goodness was as deep as mine and who had seen a way through, a way for me to live a holy life in relationship with the person I loved, with a person that I love. Still, th still uh, theoretical at that point. I was looking outside for answers. That was my mistake. That was my integrity compromised. In fact, the voice that I needed to hear was God's. Today, I would look at it as simply needing to be in relationship with truth. But at the time, I called that God and it was the only voice that I would accept. And I was getting nothing. And after so many years of pleading to God for answers, I was sick of the whole struggle. I was back at university, determined to rebuild my life. I was emerging from a decade of darkness, and still I saw no light at the end of the tunnel. But I was through running. I was through struggling with moral questions over who and what I was. Either it's sin for me to love a woman, or it isn't. Decide one way or the other and move forward. I decided, like a coward, to err on the side of obedience to belief. I made a vow to God that I would live my life alone, based on my belief that homosexuality was sinful. But I said, God, if I'm wrong about this, then please, 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 please let me know. And I'm talking a great, big, unavoidable sign. Like no interpretation needed, unavoidable. I don't want to have to read into anything. God, so if I'm wrong that homosexuality is sinful, just show me somehow. And if that's the case, then here's my list of what I want. Da -da 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 -da. Several things I put on that list. And I left it at that, determined to live alone. And it was just, it was then, two weeks later, that I met Sharon. And that was that. Fell in love at first sight. And that was that. No answers to theological questions. Love changed the game entirely. All those years, I had been asking all the wrong questions. I admired myself in the hypothetical. Outside of direct relationship with truth and love. Not to mention happiness. Sharon literally snapped me out of it. Back to life, back to reality, back to being in a relationship with truth, love, and happiness. And oddly, Sharon was everything on my list, except for one thing, that she wasn't a Christian. Other than that, everything on my list. Whether that was God's great big unavoidable sign or not, I didn't care, and I still don't care. I was in love, that was that. Love was the unanswerable answer. Um, yes, we met in uh, existentialism class at university, and it took both of us by surprise. She had never dated a girl, and I had vowed never to date at all. So it was quite, it took us both by surprise. And it was interesting too how she turned everything upside down in my world. From our first conversation, I, I talked about being a lesbian. Uh, I'm feeling that was sinful. And she thought that was. She's told me, I always knew that there were people out there who were homophobic or people who thought that oh, there's something wrong with homosexuality, but she never thought she would meet one. She said, it was, she said for her it was like racism. She'd always known that there's something called racism out there, that there are people out there who are racist, but she never thought she would meet one, let alone one who would come out and just say, I'm a racist. And yet, and she thought it was the same with homophobia. That there are people out there who think that way, but she'll never meet one. But she met me. And that really 
shakes you up. That, that takes you by surprise. Totally different way of looking at it. Um, so very quickly I moved into her house, moved into her basement. Sharon moved into her basement too. We stayed there for almost a year I suppose and after, well, after several months I decided I have to come out to my parents finally because I'm in love so I have to do this and so I went to my parents place and uh, it was very difficult to cry for three hours before finally coming out and saying that Sharon and I are so happy together they had to go through their own journey towards understanding and accepting which they did wholeheartedly it was hard because they couldn't see how this fits into everything that they've always understood about about things but with their own education and their own searching, they came to a full understanding and a full acceptance of us. And it's funny because at that same weekend that I was going to my parents' place to tell them, Sharon had decided she'd better tell her mom, because it was just her and her mom. So they went out to lunch and she was all gearing up, how do I tell my mom about this? They sit down and before Sharon has a chance to say anything, her mom pipes up with, so Sharon, are you and Caitlin in a love relationship? And uh, so that saved her having to come out of anything. So she said, yeah, and she says, her mom says, oh, finally, finally. I mean, I've been trying to tell, I've been telling all my friends that they're in a love relate. They love each other, but I don't want, she hasn't told me yet, so I don't want to, it's still secret, you know, until my daughter tells me. And then a couple of years later, I came out about being trans, which was hard in totally different ways for me and for my own parents to go through the adjustment. But meanwhile, for Sharon's mom, when he came out to her that I'm a trans guy, her reaction was, well, finally, you tell, finally. I've been telling my friends for years that this is a man in a woman's body, but he hasn't talked about it yet, so thank you, thank you. Now I can go and tell my friends that I was right all along. <laughs> so, totally different worlds, as you can see. Different worlds. Um, then we got married, uh, etc. At the time, we lived off-grid, north of Kingston, in a one-room house, no plumbing, just an outhouse. No electricity at all for the first year entirely, just candlelight. After that, just 30 watts of solar power, which is not much. And then a couple years later, we moved to Perth. And now at the end of my story, we come to living in Lanark County. And it has been wonderful. I love Lanark County. I had arrived here shortly after I transitioned. And soon after began my work as a speaker, writer, thinker. So. My life here has been very much out as a trans man and there has never been an unkind word or look. And I go around to schools, talking to schools, students, young people, old people, never an unkind word, never an unkind look. And I've had front row seats to LGBT Lanark counties, birth and growth and all of their activities and the parade, the pride parade this year in Perth and the dances and all the things that they're doing, really amazing work being done. The Upper Canada District School Board is doing incredible work with their equity and diversity forums, bringing sexual and gender diversity education to students, staff, administrators, principals, vice principals, everybody's on board. And that's happening. I've never seen such a thing happen anywhere. So it's groundbreaking and hopefully trend-setting. So I think Lanark County is amazing. You get an A-plus from me. And I'm so happy knowing that the mistakes that I made won't be made here. Young people here are being taught the importance of truth, love and happiness and kindness. And now, I'm a dad. Uh, just a few months ago, my wife and I adopted a beautiful one-year-old boy who you saw here. He's walking around the park somewhere. Um, this beautiful boy, Dominic, love him to death. To death. I've often said to people that he's the only man I've ever wanted to kiss. <laughs> and I can't stop, it's addictive. I think, I think that finally I'm grounded. I'll always be floating in the in-between spaces in life, I think. Connected and apart, different and the same, familiar and foreign. But finally, I have a role to play out. It is the last role I ever expected for myself, but it is the finest one in all my life, and it is mine. I am daddy, and that is permanent and unalterable. If I play this role outright, my son will grow up knowing 
and never forgetting the importance of truth, love, and happiness. I got this hat from Almont. Do you recognize? This is um, the Almont uh, High School hat. They sent it to me after I spoke at their school one time. They sent it to me and they said, be careful wearing that hat in Carlton Place. Those colors are fighting colors. <laughs> Does, I have a question. Yeah. Why I don't care? Why, Why I don't care? <laughs> it, I don't care touches everything for me. First of all, why the shirt was a hand-me-down, so there was no strategy, no pre-planning behind this message. I got the hand-me-down shirt just a couple weeks before my first presentation. It fit. I liked it. I don't have many clothes. So, and then, and I also, I had recently been fired from my job very suddenly, very unexpectedly, very painful experience. So I was floating again, and and hurt. And here I am about to launch out on, I'm a speaker, writer, thinker, blah, 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 you know? And I know how silly that sounds, but it's true. It's just literal, not pretentious. And so to do something like that, that I know is as ridiculous as it sounds, and going out and speaking, and I had to wear this in order to do it. I had to say, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, in order to do it. It freed me up to do it. I don't care. If nobody shows up, I don't care, you know? And then it has become more and more and more. And I thought one day maybe I'll give a talk about I don't care. Because we get so hung up on everything. What people think, what we think our parents expect of us, what we think God expects of us, what we expect of ourselves, the life we thought we would have, and how hard it can be to let go of your image of what your life should be. There's so much letting go that has to happen in order for life to be good. That this message, to me, I say to people, the only thing I care about is making life better. Everything else I don't care. And the deeper that goes, the gladder I am that I decided to wear this shirt that first time. I might give a talk about it one day. Yeah. It's funny because teenagers seem to love it. I'll be walking down the street in this shirt and, and the you know, group of cool guys that you think are going to make a big stink of something or whatever. And they'll walk by and say, hey, dude, I like your shirt. Teenagers love it, grown-ups hate it. Adults, I hate your shirt, get another shirt, wear a shirt that says I care, stuff like that. And it's funny, actually a guy in Saskatchewan watched one of my videos and wrote to me saying, I love your talks, I love your message, but I hate your shirt. If I had a shirt made for you that says I care, would you wear it? And he did, he had a shirt made for me and mailed to me from Saskatchewan that says I care. And I've saved it. My next public presentation that I've been working on for two years now, I've decided um, it's going to be on forgiveness. And for that talk, I'm going to wear the I Care shirt. Because what I'm going to have to say about forgiveness, I know I can't say wearing a shirt that says I don't care. When it comes to the letting go of our deepest pains and injuries, I can't talk about that with a shirt that says I don't care. Because I do. So. As if he actually made you a shirt, that's all. Awesome. I know, I know. It's so sweet. It's great. A gay Mennonite man. Yeah. Really sweet. And actually, there um, that's the second shirt I've ever had made for me. Um, another time after a bullying talk, the, uh, a, a parent of an elementary school student was attending the talk, and she really liked it. And she thought, I should have shirts. Instead of wearing, I don't care, wear a shirt that says witness. So she had a shirt made for me that says witness, because bullying. Bullying will stop if we just take the responsibility of being witnesses to it. Witness coming from, the word wit come, has two roots. From the Sanskrit vid, meaning to make known, and the Latin videre, meaning to make seen. Witness means to make known and to make seen. And if we were all witnesses to the bullying that we actually do see everywhere around us, every day. Um, then there would be no bullying. So she made me a shirt that says witness, and I, I wear that to bullying talks. And I think one of the biggest problems with bullying is that all of us tend to think of it as what somebody else does. 
everybody bullies in some form or another. And especially, I agree, bullying begins often, often at home. Because if you are raised with a self-esteem that is whole, unmeddled with, then you know exactly where the boundaries are. You know exactly how a person can treat you. You know exactly what your dignity is worth. If there's any questions about that, then you're vulnerable to bullying. And that kind of security comes from your parents. Well, when I talk about bullying, I make it very clear, not just the Mr. Muscle, the cool guy kind of bully. It could be your parents, it could be your teacher, it could be your sibling, and it could be your best friend. We have to call it for what it is. And it could be very subtle, so that if you were to call somebody on it, they could say, oh, come on, you're just making a big deal out of nothing. There's a lot of rooting out that needs to be, needs to be done. There's bullying in all relationship. Being the exercising of your will over somebody else's to get what you want out of something. Many, many forms of it. And often too, when it comes to things like mental illness, depression, um, which a lot of young people, adolescents struggle with. And I talk about that in, that in the context of bullying. What's happening is you're sending negative messages to yourself. You're beating yourself up. And what's going on in there is that you're being the bully, the victim, and the witness all rolled up in one and none of them doing anything to stop it. So stop it. I think that's a great tragedy that the majority of the actual bullying that happens every day, everywhere, people don't feel validated, validated to call it bullying. And I've been talking about bullying and I hear all the time people saying, oh, there's so much talk about bullying. Everyone says I've been a bully victim. I've been this and that. And everyone wants their 15 minutes of sympathy kind of thing. And I think that's a disgusting attitude to have towards it. If somebody's being hurt in any way by anyone for any reason, this is serious and it's worth taking seriously. And when you look at the what makes cruelty possible and how you get treated by others and sometimes what frees you from a situation like that is just naming it, calling it what it is. And having somebody else give voice to that gives them their voice and you can deal with it. Which isn't to shut people out or get angry or yeah. forgiveness, he the healing of a relationship. And life is relationship. 